tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening! You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 1. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, the debut of our latest and greatest 8th season, with 24 brand new episodes to scare your socks off, I'll be performing four tales to terrify you, all of them from author Michael Whitehouse, about haunted hermits, malevolent children, eerie ruins, and sinister sirens. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight from Michael Whitehouse involves two boys who go in search of an old path through the woods, looking to see if the stories of an old hermit's hut are true. Truth, however, can be a lot stranger than fiction, as they're about to find out. Without further ado, I present to you Carson's Folly. Youth is forever entwined with adventure. The vast horizon speeds away from a young mind into infinity, a world to be discovered, Possibilities waiting to be made certainties. Out there, beyond. Not far from where we now sit, two teenagers propelled by that hunger for adventure found more than they bargained for. It's their story I wish to tell tonight. But first, throw some more wood on the fire, for such a tale should not be so carelessly told when the darkness creeps in. When you came to these woods, to this camping spot, you may have noticed a dirt track splitting off from the main road. Don't be alarmed if you passed it without knowing, for it's overgrown now. The entrance to it is being slowly consumed by the forest itself. If you were to hack away at the long grass and spindly branches that cover it now, you would find Carson's Folly. At least... That's what the dirt track used to be called. Much like its history, its name has largely been forgotten, but not so by Bert Mason. You see, Bert knew that place well. Growing up in the 1950s, it was a favorite venue for rites of passage. Teenagers would drive or hike to Carson's Folly to just show how brave they were to see how far up the path they could get before their nerves got the better of them. 
to see just how long they could last. Bert even did it himself once, but after walking along its winding track for ten minutes, he heard something rustling in the surrounding woods and lost his nerve. The play stayed in his mind, though, for decades, until one day he decided to tell his grandson the story behind Carson's Folly. Why people believed it was haunted. For Bert, it was just good fun watching his 13-year-old grandson being creeped out by the account. But for his grandson, the tale ignited something within, a mystery that had to be revealed. His name was Garth. And he always had hair-brained ideas of adventure. The previous summer, he'd persuaded two of his friends that by climbing to the top of their school roof, they would impress their classmates and, as he put it, get all the girls. What they got were suspensions and a difficult time from their parents. Once Garth had heard Bert's story, he knew exactly what he was going to do. Within minutes, he was on the phone with Johnny, his best friend. No matter what sort of adventure Garth had in mind, Johnny was always a willing and able partner. Well, that was until the school roof stunt. Johnny had been banned from hanging around with Garth by his parents. They didn't want him getting into any more trouble and saw Garth as the quintessential bad influence. At first, Johnny said no to his friend's idea and hung up. Then he ignored Garth calling back. Over the next three days at school, he tried in vain to avoid him as much as possible. But Garth knew his friend and knew that eventually he'd give in. Finally, after phone calls and constant badgering, Johnny agreed to go with him, to go to Carson's Folly. If it would shut him up and give him some peace, in reality it gave him anything but. The path looked much like it does now, overgrown, hidden from passing campers and hikers by time, and a thick wall of greenery. But his grandfather's description of the track and how to get to it was ingrained in Garth's mind, as was the reason for its supposed unnatural properties, a reason that he had skirted over for fear that Johnny would get scared and refuse to go with him. Garth had written his grandfather's story down as soon as the telling had been over, and knew that after getting a bus to the outskirts of the forest, that they'd only have to walk a few miles to find a track. Deeper and deeper into the woods they went, following the only road that cut through the forest, like an erstwhile sketch of civilization. No cars passed them. They were quite alone. On the way, as they followed the road, the two boys talked about the things that usually held their attention, the best-looking girls in their classes, what they would do to the school bullies if they ever had the chance, whether Johnny's dad would ever calm down and let them hang out together at their house again. Not an unsurprising chat for two 13-year-old friends. At that age, the world had not revealed its thorny underbelly yet, and so, for the most part, life was simple for them. Eventually, they came to a fork in the road. Following Bert's descriptions, they went left. In hindsight, I'm sure they would have preferred the right road, or perhaps to retrace their steps and leave the woods behind entirely. But they were too young to fully appreciate that if you go looking for trouble, you often find it, or trouble finds you. After walking for another mile, Garth knew they were near. He told Johnny, who was currently telling a story about his underage cousin's failed attempts to sneak into a bar in town, to put a sock in it for a moment while he concentrated. Scanning a blind turn in the road, they both fell silent. Sure enough, along the thick web of leaves and branches which lined the road, they saw something half sticking out of the forest. A signpost. It was rotten, and the plate that at one time had recorded the name of the place was long gone now. By the looks of the wood, which had splintered where an old nail hung on it in vain, the sign had been torn deliberately from the post. Taken for what purpose, Garth didn't know. But what he did know was that this was the place. 
The signpost was slathered in a green moss, and if he had not been looking for it, then he doubtless would have passed by it unaware. Johnny helped pull back some branches as Garth gleefully stepped forward into the woodland, his face beaming with excitement. There was no mistaking it. They were standing on a path. The ground had been consumed mostly by large ferns uh, that stood eerie silent. But a small slither of the path remained, visible enough to be followed like a crooked arrow pointing inward. Garth grew in his excitement and encouraged Johnny to come with him. But Johnny was reluctant. It wasn't that he believed the track was haunted. He was pretty sure it was all nonsense. But there was that what-if, the same what-if that made him question what was in his closet when his bedroom light was off, the same what-if that made him walk that much faster when passing the local graveyard in the evening, the same what-if that had planted a very real sense of dread there and then in his mind. In response, Garth resorted to a friendly name-calling, telling Johnny to stop being such a wimp, that all they were doing was going on their rites of passage, as his grandfather had called it. They would walk to the end of the path and then home, showing that they were braver than the generations that had come before. It would not be that difficult, just an hour there and an hour back. By the time they were out of the forest, the sun would still be high in the sky, and they'd make it home in time for dinner, perhaps stopping for a milkshake at the local cafe on the way. Reluctantly, Johnny gave in just to stop Garth from yapping, the result of name-calling either stirring action or suffocating inaction. I think it was the former in this case, but who really knows? As he stepped off the main forest road, the leaves Johnny had been holding back with his hands now returned to their previous state, once more hiding Carson's folly from passers-by. The light dimmed slightly, and looking behind, it was difficult now to see the road given how thick the trees and bushes had become. Noticing this, Johnny nervously asked Garth how they'd find the road again if they wandered too far into the woods. But Garth just laughed and said, We'll follow the track back, of course. What was left of the slither of track, which had not been completely devoured by the forest, reached out in front of them, twisting and turning like a serpent. As they walked, the sound of the forest were all around, a woodpecker somewhere hammering against bark, something burrowing under a brush as they passed, the occasional trickling of water in unseen streams from which tree roots and other things drank deep. After about twenty minutes, Johnny began to relax, his initial fear of Carson's folly diminishing somewhat, replaced by the relaxation of being surrounded by the life of the woods. He relaxed so much, in fact, that he began to inquire about the story Garth's grandfather had told about the path, why people used to believe the track was haunted. Garth let out sort of a half laugh, and Johnny wondered why. He more than wondered, in fact. He was put back on edge immediately. Because he knew that laugh. It was the same smirking noise Garth made whenever he was up to mischief. The laugh he used when he persuaded Johnny to climb up onto the school roof. The laugh that other parents at the school were convinced would get their kids into trouble. The truth was, Garth had told a watered-down version of the history behind Carson's folly. He'd told Johnny that no one knew why people thought it was haunted. It was just that a local kid at the time had said they saw a ghost on the track once. The story caught on, and the other kids would then come to the track to see how brave they were and to go searching for spirits that did not exist. But when Garrus laughed settled into an impish grin, it was clear that he had lied. Johnny started to feel the forest closing in on him, a kind of claustrophobia, as Gareth finally relayed what his grandfather Bert had really told him. The footpath was named after a man named Carson. Not long before Bert himself tried to walk the path, sometime in the early 1930s or 40s, 
Carson had been known to the townspeople in the area. He'd started off as a respectable type, a schoolteacher, in fact. He was the epitome of the small-town dream. Well-groomed, well-spoken, and well-meaning. He even taught children at Sunday school so that they could learn everything they needed about heaven and hell, about judging and being judged, about what was expected of those children. Religion was important to the people back then. To some, it still is. No one knew exactly when it happened, but Carson, still a relatively young man at the time, began to act strangely. It seemed to correspond with him, receiving a series of handwritten letters that were sent to him, left on the doorstep of his house. He'd carry them under his arm around town and at school, poring over them at every interval with a look of panic on his face. The content of the letters remained a secret for the most part, as did the sender. Indeed, there was no stamp or address upon the envelopes. It looked like they had been delivered by hand, and though Carson refused to speak with anyone about them, there were rumors that one day he had absent-mindedly left one of the letters on his school desk. As the story goes, one of the children sneaked a peek at what was inside. Supposedly, the paper was covered in patches of darkened dampness and soil, and words of a sort were jaggedly written with what looked like charcoal. What the words were, the child never had a chance to determine. They were written in a peculiarly erratic handwriting, and just as the child was trying to read them, Carson returned to his desk to recover the letter. He was furious at the child for invading his privacy, and raised his hand as if to strike him. But a calmness then took over, and he simply patted the child on his head and told him to run along. Shortly after this incident, Carson lost his good humor, his hair began to grow out, and he refused to shave, becoming disheveled. His friends tried to talk to him, but he seemed disinterested in what they had to say. It appeared that Carson had developed not only an aversion to small-town life, but an active dislike for it. At Sunday school, he would talk to the children in a feverish tone, all fire and brimstone. Eventually, he was asked to give it up because his descriptions of fiery damnation, burning flesh and all, were frightening the children. As soon as he had saved up enough money, Carson bought a plot of land away from town, in this forest, to be exact. People thought him mad. There was nothing out there. Clearing, perhaps, but no road that served it. He laughed at the scowling faces of the townspeople, many of whom whispered about him being erratic and untrustworthy. Some even whispered that he was a man possessed and that it was those letters that had done it. Once he had legally purchased the plot of land he desired, he then left his job and disappeared into the woods, leaving the town behind for good. Several years passed, and no one heard of Carson for some time. That was until a forest ranger spotted something one day, a new path that had joined the road, just a larger dirt track at that time. Next to the path, a signpost had been driven into the ground reading, Carson's Lodge, Friends Welcome, with an arrow pointing into the woods. Carson had been busy. He had cut a long, winding path through the forest, one that led to a large wooden cabin he had seemingly built himself. The forest ranger, who first found the path, investigated, and after following it, found Carson sitting on the porch of a large, sturdy cabin that he had clearly put together using the materials of the forest. His beard was long and matted, and his hair shaggy, reaching below his shoulders, but there was no doubt that it was he. When approached by the ranger, Carson smiled and seemed content enough, although a little nervous, glancing around him. The ranger told him that the locals had been worried about him for some time. Carson brushed this off, saying that he was done with, as he put it, the world of man. All he needed was in the forest. That, and that he was nearly finished, but would refuse to elaborate on what he was referring to. His cabin, perhaps, but no one knows. 
Worried about him, the ranger offered to bring some of Carson's old friends up from town to see him, and that was when Carson's smile turned. He grew angry and impatient. Thinking him mad, the ranger retreated, leaving Carson alone, and returned to the town to tell the local police officer what he had found. Several others tried to go there and reach Carson, but he told them to stay away, that he just wanted to be left alone, and that was when it occurred to one of Carson's old friends to ask him the purpose of the signpost. If he wanted to be left alone, why had he so clearly left directions for others to find him? Not others, Carson had said. Just a few I've invited. From the town? his friend inquired. No, just my friends out here. There was something chilling about that last sentence. Just my friends out here. As far as anyone knew, no one lived within miles. Carson was the only lodge in that part of the forest, so the idea that he had made friends out there made many back at the town uncomfortable. For several months there were stories about Carson. The forest ranger who had encountered him before had seen him several times, standing by the signpost and looking across the road into the trees. He appeared anxious, but when the ranger asked about it, Carson grew angry again. They'll come, he said. They'll be here soon. We've been corresponding. When winter rolled in, some of Carson's friends grew worried about him. It had been a few months since anyone had seen him, and even the forest ranger had not encountered him since the early autumn. So a group of concerned town folks hiked up through the forest road to the signpost for Carson's lodge and followed the footpath until they reached it. The door to the cabin lay open, and inside the stench of rotten meat filled the air. The town folks found a slaughtered deer in the back. It had been gutted, but it had been left to fester, hanging by its haunches from the rafters. On the table was a half-eaten meal. It looked like some kind of stew, but it too had festered, and amongst what little remained of a putrid broth, dead insects floated on the surface. One solitary chair was overturned. It seemed clear to everyone that day that Carson had not been at his cabin for some time. More than that, he had left in a hurry, abandoning a meal and knocking over some furniture on his way. This was puzzling. Someone in the party wondered if he had finally gone insane and had run out into the forest to perish in the cold winter. That's when they heard it, a sound from nearby, like wood upon wood, a solitary, loud thud that reverberated between the trees. What was that? The search party asked among themselves. The noise came again, this time closer, and in the dim surroundings of Carson's cabin, rotting deer and all, they became frightened. They ran as fast as they could out of the cabin and back up through the forest path that Carson himself had made. When they made it back to town, they were pale white, and they headed straight to the local bar for a stiff drink. The other locals asked what they had found, but the consensus was that Carson was still out there somewhere. The reason being that when the members of the search party were running from the strange thudding noise in the forest... One of them turned to look behind them, and for a moment they were sure they saw a man walking behind them at pace. But the witness could not verify that it was Carson. That was only a guess. When Garth finally finished relaying what he had been told about the path they were on now, Johnny stopped in his tracks. He was scared and angry, scared about the story, and furious at Garth, for only telling him the truth once they were well along Carson's path. As always, Carth giggled in delight at his friend's anxiety. It's only a story, he said. But what if Carson's still out here? Johnny asked. He'd be long dead by now. It all happened when my granddad was a kid, came the reply. There was some back and forth between the two, but just as Garth would always laugh in delight, 
Whenever Johnny got scared, he knew when to dial things back and build them up again. With some reassurance that they must have been near Carson's cabin, Gareth promised that as soon as they reached it, they would turn back. All he wanted was for them to lay eyes on it and return with tales about how brave they were. Johnny reluctantly agreed, as he always did, but as they continued along the path, that growing sense of dread continued. Brushing past a tree on the edge of the path, for a moment he thought that someone was standing next to him, only to see a warped old tree trunk where he thought he had seen a figure. The noises of the forest heightened, and each rustle in the undergrowth or twig snapping above in the canopy reinforced the feeling that they were not alone, in Johnny's mind at least. Gareth seemed much happier. We walked much further than my grandfather ever did, he said with pride in his voice. The path suddenly stopped then. A wall of leaves from a large bush stood in their way, sprouting up six or seven feet into the air out of the forest floor. Certain that the path must have continued on the other side, Garth clambered over and threw the leaves without hesitation. Johnny waited on the other side, hoping that they had reached a dead end and that they could retrace their steps and go home. But that was not to be. His friend let out a cheer from the other side, telling Johnny to follow him. Pushing through the leaves, a branch scraped by Johnny's side, but the pain was quickly replaced by an overwhelming feeling of excitement and dread. A curious concoction. Garth was pointing ahead and up a small incline. At the top, Johnny could see an old log cabin. A tree had fallen on the roof some time ago, poking a large hole inside, and moss, bushes, and climbing plants had turned the dark wood into a thick green in places. Glassless windows peered down at both boys, and before Johnny could stop him, Garth rushed up toward the porch, shouting, It's Carson's cabin! It's real! We made it! Okay, so it's real. Can we go now? Johnny asked. But Garth had not walked all that way to turn back so quickly, despite his earlier promises. He had to see what was inside. The door laid half open, the top hinge hanging loose. Rummaging in his pack, he pulled out a torch and looked down with a grin at Johnny. Don't be scared. We'll just look inside and then go. No, replied Johnny. I want to go now. You said we just had to look at it and then we could go home. Suit yourself, said Garth. I'm going inside. You can either come with me or wait out here. On your own. He knew how to get under Johnny's skin. Looking around at the dim path that terminated at the foot of the cabin, Johnny thought about old Bert's story, about Carson and the people who said the path itself was haunted. Between standing on his own or going inside with company, he reluctantly chose the latter. Garth smiled again in triumph, turning on his torch. Inside they went. Stepping on a sea of mulch from decades of rotting leaves, they passed through the doorway. There was an earthy smell that reminded Johnny of his uncle's compost patch. Garth's diminutive torch lit the interior partially. Above the large sycamore that had landed on the roof spread its branches, its wooden fingers long since bereft of life, casting stark shadows all around like spiders' legs. With an occasional creak, the cabin made itself known to the two boys, it had seen better days, indeed. The hole in the roof left the inside exposed to the elements. A rotting table sat to the side, one of the legs broken. The remnants of an upturned chair, upturned, lay beside it. Carson's chair! Gareth whispered to himself. Okay, can we go now? Johnny asked, hoping that his friend had seen enough. In a minute, replied Gareth. Let me look around first to see if there's anything worth taking. Then we'll go. But there was not. Carson's cabin was being consumed by the forest, piece by piece. 
On the farthest away wall, a jacket hung on a metal hook, but half of it had been eaten away by damp, perhaps insects, too. But the very fact that, if the stories were true, they were staring at Carson's jacket brought delight to Garth's face and dread to Johnny's stomach. From inside the cabin, the forest sounds had diminished. The birds could be heard singing somewhere off in the distance, but the sound was muffled, as if the cabin had not yet given up all of its protection from the wilderness, keeping up most noises of the forest. Most, but not all. Johnny's bottom lip trembled when he heard it. Somewhere outside, a deep thud, like someone thumping a tree trunk with a thick piece of wood. Did you hear that? Johnny's voice had instinctively lessened to a whisper. Garth answered, saying that Johnny was just scaring himself. But then the noise sounded once more, a thud of wood upon wood outside in the forest. Johnny whispered that they should leave, and Garth for once agreed with him. That frightened Johnny more than anything else, to see his friend's usual bravado replaced by an anxious expression. Let's get back to the path, Garth said almost inaudibly. As they brushed past the dead, fallen tree's branches to get to the door, there came another noise. Both boys stopped, their feet standing still amongst the rotting leaves. But just behind them, they heard a third pair of feet shuffling through the forest deposits on the floor. Johnny let out a scream as he turned to his side and saw something between the dead tree's branches, covered in dirt and grime, something large. It moved. Quickly, both boys fled out of the cabin door, down the incline, and then to the thick bushes that had blocked their way to the cabin before. Get through, Garth shouted. They clawed at the bush, terrified that whatever was inside the cabin, whatever was at the heart of that tree, would follow. Clamoring over each other, they fell out the other side of the thick, dense bushes, landing on their backs against the path's warped surface. They scrambled to their feet erratically and did not look back, as they charged along the path in the direction of the main road, which now seemed an eternity away. Shadows crept around them, and it was as if for a moment that the trees on either side of them were closing in. Indeed, as they passed them in places, some of the shorter trees appeared almost like people standing, watching, waiting, still yet imbued with life. After they put a good distance between themselves and the cabin, both boys were out of breath. Stopping for a moment, they tried to gather their senses. What was in the cabin? asked Johnny, panting. A man, replied Garth. They debated for a moment about whether the man in the cabin was Carson himself, but Garth quelled that idea. In his words, it was probably some homeless person hiding out there. That in itself did not ease Johnny's fears. A loud thud then sounded, wood echoing between the trees. Or was it from them? Johnny apprehensively offered that it was not coming from the cabin, but from somewhere else in the forest. It sounded again, only this time there was an answer of sort. From the other side of the path, another thud. Then a third from the direction of the cabin, and a fourth from the left. Whatever or whoever was making those sounds, there was more than one of them, and it seemed as though they were communicating with one another, like a language of violent strikes and knocks. A thought festered in Johnny's mind, one that he hoped beyond all hope was untrue. It's Carson's friends, he whispered under his breath. Who? Garth asked, the look of worry on his face more pronounced than ever. Carson's friends, the ones he said he made out here in the forest, continued Johnny, the ones who sent the letters to him, the ones he made the sign for to show them the way to his cabin. Don't be silly, said Garth loudly, and just as he did, a loud thud came from just a few feet away. Both boys looked up in horror. There, Standing at the side of the path was a person, or at least 
the shape of a large person, partly hidden by the foliage despite their size, so indistinct and yet suggestive of a man. Something else then rustled from behind them, and they did not wait to find out what. They rushed off toward the main road, now just a few minutes away. As they ran, Johnny's mind filled with images of brooding figures in the woods, of Carson, mad and enraged, of him meeting with someone or something in the woods. Just what had happened to him? Footsteps followed the boys, hulking and deliberate around them. They were only young teenagers. There was no way they could outrun whatever was chasing them forever. The trees felt like people lining the path, ready to reach out a hand to grab one of them and keep them there for all time. Garth let out a scream of pain as a low-hanging branch scraped along the side of his stomach, snagging on his clothes. Help, Johnny! He yelled his t-shirt had caught on the branch, blood dripping from the wound. A groan now sounded from just a few feet away, an angry, vengeful sound closing in. Johnny looked ahead and could see a wall of leaves, just a few more steps, and he'd be on the main forest road, away from Carson's folly, away from whatever was stalking them, hopefully forever. In that moment he thought about leaving his friend, survival overwhelming him, the desire to leave that place behind. But as he turned, he saw the look on Garth's face. Tears began to stream from his friend's eyes as something large reached out from between the bushes and grabbed Garth by the shoulder, a hand covered in what looked like soil or dirt, or was it hair? Johnny instinctively lunged toward his friend and grabbed his foot as the hand pulled on Garth, dragging him backwards toward the bush, letting out a horrible gasp of air. Garth's face went sheet white as if the realization of what was about to happen had finally dawned on him. But Johnny would not let go. He pulled with all his might and heard another groan. But this time it did not come from the brutal figure attacking them. It came from the tree branch Garth had been stuck on. Giving way with a sharp crunch, it snapped in two. A loud rip sounded as Garth fell forward onto Johnny both tumbling to the ground. They scrambled to their feet as the darkened hand held on to the now torn remnants of Garth's T-shirt, the hand pulling back into the undergrowth. Run! Johnny shouted, and they did, diving through the wall of leaves and branches in front of them. The world opened up slightly, the sky above now visible. Both of them had emerged onto the main forest road. But did that mean the danger was over? They stood away from the old rotting signpost, gasping, there in the middle of the deserted road, staring at each other in disbelief. They'd made it. Made it all the way to Carson's cabin and all the way back. Well, almost. As they turned to run down the road for fear of being pursued further, they heard a snap, the unmistakable sound of twigs broken by footfalls. It came from the path to the cabin just behind the leaves. Carson's Folly, as it was named, and for good reason, the boys now both knew. For Johnny recoiled in horror at the sight of a dark figure obscured by the overgrown branches and leaves of the forest, standing on the path that led to Carson's lodge, standing there still and watchful. You ain't invited, a graveled voice said. The voice cracked with age and garbled as if by rotting leaves of the forest themselves. At this warning, Johnny and Garth continued running, never looking back, and did not stop until they had left the forest behind. When they finally reached the town, they received some strange looks from those nearby. After all, Garth's t-shirt had been torn from him, and a large, fortunately superficial cut ran along his side, they made it home and tried to tell their parents what had happened. Garth chastised his grandfather, Bert, for sending him off into the forest with his silly stories. And all Johnny's parents could do was blame Garth for putting a lot of nonsense into their son's head. Despite Johnny's parents' wishes, the two boys remained close friends until they were about 18 and headed off in different directions, as people often do at that age. Occasionally, they'd cross paths, meet up for a beer, 
and talk about old times. And when they did, they always came back to who or what they had encountered on Carson's Folly, joking that they had probably just got carried away and that it was someone camping out at the cabin who had just tried to scare them off. But those words spoken by that figure on the path still stick with Johnny to this day. You ain't invited. He wonders about them. Perhaps Carson had made friends out there after all, and if he was not still hanging around, maybe, just maybe, his friends still were. I hope you enjoyed Carson's Folly, as written by author Michael Whitehouse and performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support them by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse. Visit his official page, where he uploads short stories for your perusal by his books, including his best-selling, On a Hill, or make the most terrifying choice of all, and follow him on Twitter. And by all means, if you enjoy what you read, don't forget to leave him a five-star review and a kind word, and let him know you heard about him here on this show. Thanks again for your support of this program and of tonight's featured author. Our second trek into the dark recesses of the trees begins now, courtesy once again of Mr. Whitehouse. Jack and his wife decided to take a trip to Scotland in the late 1970s to visit their ancestral homeland. But as he recounts in the modern day, instead of sweet memories, it became a nightmare that haunts them even now. Without further ado, I present to you Sea of Green. From the Diary of Jake Sato. Dated May 11th, 2019. I've always tried to rationally think through how we got here. What happened to lead us down this path? Why did life turn out like this? When I do, my mind always comes back to that summer's day in Scotland. Everything stems from that like a collapsed vein. A happier time cut off from us in the past. And nowhere else to go but this tainted present. Back in 1977, my wife, Jenna, and I saw something neither of us could comprehend. It changed us forever. We were staying in a small Scottish village called Aberfoyle, for a week at the time, it was a quaint place surrounded by pleasant rolling hills, woodland, and locks. From our hotel, we could explore the lush Scottish scenery, something Jenna had wanted to do since she was a kid. Her mother was Scottish, and although she had passed away when my wife was very young, Jenna always felt a deep connection to the country. It was a spiritual home of sorts. She was fascinated by it. The vast spaces of green, clear blue waters, snow, rain, wind, sun piercing through it, if you were lucky. It was the natural world and its element. Most of all, Jenna cherished the few memories she had of her mother telling stories about Scotland. It was a mystical place for her and her family, and that pull to see it firsthand only grew over the years. I'd spent my childhood in a small town in the Midwest. I had my fill of nature and preferred the streets of Boston as an adult. But when my wife turned 30, I knew that a trip across the Atlantic would make the perfect present. When I told her where we were going, she was so happy. Aberfoyle Village was barely more than a main street at the time, with our hotel, well, I say hotel, but it was more of a bed and breakfast, sitting on one of the rare empty back streets. At night, the place shut down except for a solitary pub, leaving us to breathe in the relative silence and darkness of the surrounding hills and forests. 
The first night there, we had a dinner at a small restaurant. That night brought more than its fair share of surprises. The first was when I surprised Jenna with a silver bracelet engraved with a suitably soppy message on the underside. But that wasn't where the unexpected ceased. Jenna then dropped the biggest surprise of all. She was pregnant with our first child. We'd been trying for over a year, and we were beginning to worry that something was wrong, and so to hear that she was pregnant was overwhelming. We celebrated, Jenna on the orange juice, me on the scotch. The next day my head was pounding, and I asked that we stay closer to the hotel rather than have our planned trip to Glasgow City. Jenna was a little put off, but by lunchtime, my headache had lifted a little, and I suggested a walk through the countryside as a compromise. The night before, one of the locals had told me about a scenic walk through Queen Elizabeth Forest. It sounded perfect and just a short drive away. If I had to hurl, at least I wouldn't be doing it in front of other people. Jenna was excited to get out and about, and so we drove for about 20 minutes from Aberfoyle and parked in a small makeshift parking lot inside the forest. This was the place the trails started, and they could only be explored on foot. When we got out, the scent of pines was sweet in the air, and the fresh smell made me feel much better. Although I've been told the location is now more popular, on that day, we saw no other cars on the road into the forest, and the parking lot itself was empty. The sun was high in the sky, and we headed on foot toward what was supposed to be a relaxing forest walk. I remember smiling at Jenna. She was so beautiful. A wooden information board showed us the route we were to take. Given her condition, I didn't want Jenna to overexert herself, so we took the path marked in green, which meant it should have been the easiest trail. And it was, for a while. The path moved through pockets of pine trees and had clearly been used many times before. It was picturesque, and with each step, I started to understand why Jenna had been so happy to visit the place. There is undoubtedly something necessary about getting away from the world to lose yourself in nature. It's like we still have an ancient part of ourselves that gets nourished by the deep greenery. As we strolled along the dirt path, we started talking about what we would call the baby if it were a boy or a girl. It was then that we realized we were not alone. In front of us, in the distance, a young boy walked out from the tree line and stood on the path about 50 yards away, just staring at us. He looked to be eight or nine years old. Being in an isolated area would have been unnerving to begin with, but what immediately filled me with disbelief was the fact that the boy was clearly naked. The sun reflected off his skin and his pale color was stark against the green of the forest. What do you do in a situation like that? This was in the 1970s, and although there were always whispers of terrible things happening behind closed doors, it was long before the public truly accepted that many children were being abused or mistreated. Still, the unsettling sight was soon replaced with concern for the child. Jenna picked up the pace and shouted, Hello! But something immediately made me grab her hand and stop her from running up to the boy. I asked Jenna to stay put, not just for herself, but for our unborn child's sake. The last thing I wanted was for a stressful situation to affect the pregnancy. Reluctantly, she stayed where she was, and I stepped forward towards the boy. As I drew closer, I realized just how pale and emaciated he was, as though he had been kept somewhere, malnourished and away from sunlight for some time. "'Are you okay?' I asked. Where are your parents? He just looked at me, the skin beneath his eyes darker than the surrounding skin. Cautiously, I moved closer, with my arms open so as not to scare him. Let, let us help you. 
Maybe we could take you to the police or help you find your parents. The closer I got, the more I felt the uncertainty of the situation. There was something very wrong with the boy. I expected him to move back or show some sort of fear, but he didn't. In fact, I was sure that a subtle grin momentarily flickered across his face before returning to the same somber expression as before. By this time, I was standing straight in front of him. I asked him, "'What's your name?' Again he said nothing, but now he was looking intently into my eyes, and that gaze carried with it nothing but menace. The boy then reached out his right hand and touched the center of my chest. The touch of his fingers left me unsure of myself. I turned to look back at Jenna down the path to ask her what I should do. As I turned, I heard a rustling sound, and when I looked back toward the boy, he was no longer there. I followed the rustling to the side of the path. The ground dipped down into a slight incline. There, the trees and bushes created thick clumps of leaves and branches. It looked difficult to traverse, and I thought that the boy's naked skin must have been scraped and cut to pieces running about in there. It was so dim between the trees, a, a tangled green mess. Waiting for a moment, I listened. There was nothing other than the occasional creak of a branch swaying in the gentle breeze. Above, the sun shone down directly onto the path, but just a few steps forward, and I would have been engulfed by the dark of the forest. The difference in light was stark in my mind, and though I wanted to help the kid, everything about the situation left me in a wary state of mind. Seeing no sign of the boy, I walked back to Jenna. She asked where he was. I said I didn't know and told her that he'd disappeared into the forest when my back was turned. Jenna looked pale and she gave me a look I knew only too well. I'd seen it a few times over the previous few years. Something was on her mind, and she just had to get it out. Jenna looked me straight in the eye and said, I never saw the boy leave the path. She insisted that if it was as if he had just vanished. One moment he was there, the next he was gone. I was caught in a difficult situation. This was long before the common cell phone. One of us needed to alert the authorities that there was a young boy stranded in the woods, running around as naked as the day he was born. Considering how deep and thick the section of the forest around us was, he could easily have fallen and hit his head on a rock, or later died of hypothermia when the night came. There was only one thing we could do. One of us would have to stay put in case the kid needed help, while the other would walk back to the car, drive into Aberfoyle, and raise the alarm. There was no question that I would stay in the forest, but I didn't feel right about letting Jenna go back to the car by herself. Even if she hadn't been pregnant, I wouldn't have liked it. But Jenna was always stronger-willed than me, and although I would try to pull the usual strong husband routine, common at the time, she was nearly always immune to it. Jenna insisted that she would head back down to the path and that I should try and find the kid, but not to stray too far. She would be back as soon as possible with help. I told her to honk the horn when she was leaving the parking lot. That way I'd know she got back to the car okay. I got a smile and a roll of the eyes in return, but she promised to do it if it made me feel better. She gave me a kiss on the cheek and walked back the way we had come. I watched her until she disappeared from view. Although I'd spent the last ten years living in Boston, I grew up in the Midwest, and so hikes through the woods were not alien to me. But this was different. There was something off about that long stretch of path. It was flanked by pine trees so close together that the forest was as dark as twilight once you stepped off the path and into it. And that was something I had no intention of doing. The tree line was like an impenetrable wall to me. Nevertheless, I stared intently at it in search of the smallest sign of life. 
I was sure that since I hadn't heard anyone moving around in there, the boy must still have been near. He would have made too much noise moving through the uneven and uncluttered terrain. There was a sense of loneliness about that place. No, not loneliness, but isolation. Like it was an arm from the body of the world. Such environments infect the mind with paranoia, and as I was entertaining the stark atmosphere of the place, I kept my eyes on the side of the path from where the boy had first appeared. My imagination took over. I began to think about the kid lost in the woods. I thought about how he'd gotten into such a situation, and those thoughts were too dark to dwell on. I turned my mind to a lighter explanation. Maybe there was a lock nearby, and he was swimming there with friends. I thought. They took his clothes as a prank, and then he'd followed the path trying to get back to town. Yes, that, that made sense. It must have been something like that. But why did he not speak to me? And what of his skin? It was unusually pale, and that flicker of a smile on his face, it caused me doubt just to think about it. Continuing my vigil, I wondered why Jenna hadn't honked her car horn yet as she left the parking lot. I was sure she would have made it back there by then. That's when I thought I saw movement. I don't know if it was a deer or the missing boy himself. Slowly, I stepped toward the edge of the path and peered in. The quiet of the place took over, and I stared steadily for any hint of movement. I was so focused that I had no time to react to the real danger. Something walked out of the woods from behind me at speed. I barely had a moment to turn, and when I did... Something large and white put its hands on me. It knocked me from the path, and as I fell down the incline into the trees and bushes in front, a searing pain cut across my vision. A branch of pipe needles scratched across my left eyeball, leaving me unable to see out of it. Instinct kicked in, and I fled deeper between the trees, the branches cracking and prodding around me as I did so. Blood and tears oozed from my injured left eye, and as I looked back momentarily with my right eye, I saw, standing on the sunlit path, two people, a woman and a man. Both were naked, and their skin was as white as the boys I'd seen, gleaming in the summer sun. Both figures stepped forward towards where I was, and I quickly attempted to hide within the cutting embrace of a large pine tree, but it was clear that they could see me somehow. It was at that moment that I heard the distant sound of a car horn. A sense of relief cut through my adrenaline. I could at least be happy that Jenna had made it back to the car without incident, hopefully out of the forest and away from my attackers. The man and the woman stared at me through the trees, their gaze dark and malevolent, angry even. When he and the woman moved toward where I stood, I panicked and picked up a moss-covered rock in the ground at my feet. It was the only way to protect myself. I watched, anticipating their movements, waiting for them to attack. The woman spoke to the man, and her words were unlike any I had heard before. It wasn't just the language that confused me, but I'm uncertain how any human could make such a sound. Beneath the words was an unusual noise. Each word lay on top of a breath, like a storm swelling and pushing through a constricted space. The man answered with a lower, yet equally airy voice. There they were, waiting. I might not have understood the language, but I knew they meant to harm me, and for the first time the thought that I might never leave that forest alive rose up in my mind. Just as the man finally lurched towards where I was, my heart began to race. If the sound of Jenna striking our car horn had made me feel more at ease, the second time it sounded put me on edge. When the horn sounded for a third, then a final fourth time, I knew something terrible had happened. Jenna needed help. There was no time for dialogue. These people, whoever they were, 
had undoubtedly hurt the boy that we had encountered, and now they were hell-bent on hurting me and my wife. Who knew how many of them there were? I had to get back to Jenna to make sure she was okay. The man continued moving forward with pine branches, breaking against his skin. When he reached me, I leapt forward and swung the rock in my hand with all my might. When it contacted his head, I was certain I'd killed him. Something cracked inside of his skull. I felt it. Blood sprayed across me, and he staggered back onto the trail. I will never forget the piercing, inhuman scream the woman let out when she leaned over to help her bloodied companion. The man's pale white face had come apart from the attack, his features now a flap of skin hanging from the side of his head. The woman stood up to come at me, and shocked at what I had done, I ran back down the path. Looking back with my one good eye, I could see that she was still with the man's crumpled body, and so I focused purely on reaching Jenny. When I got to the parking lot, I wasn't sure what I saw at first. The car door was open, and Jenna was lying in the driver's seat. A small, pale white figure was hunched over her, doing something. As I ran to the car, the figure, who I could now see was the boy we had first encountered, let out a screech and held a bloody mess in his hands. I was too late. The boy scampered off toward the surrounding forest, but as he reached the tall grass just before the tree line, he stopped. Crouching down, he turned and stared at me, his white skin bleached red with my wife's blood. I didn't care if I was going to die. I took a deep breath and turned to look at what he had done to my wife. She was sitting in the driver's seat, her eyes glazed, but I didn't understand. She was looking at me in a daze, smiling. There was no blood, no visible wound that I could see. I dreamt about our child, she said. Then she lost consciousness. I pulled her still-breathing body out of the driver's seat and lay her gently in the back. She was talking to herself, mumbling something, as though she were in a deep, confusing dream. My only thought was to get her to a hospital. Climbing into the car, I slammed the doors shut. All the while, the boy, covered in blood, nestling something in his hands, stared at me from the tall grass. But he was no longer alone. The man and woman I had encountered on the path were with him, and the man, though he bore a scar down the side of his cheek, looked as though his entire face had been sewed back on. They watched silently as I drove out of the parking lot, and I was left with the uneasy feeling that they allowed me to leave. Jenna recovered in a local hospital, and to my complete surprise and joy, our baby was still alive and healthy inside of its mother. We spoke with the local police. Of course, no one believed us, and why would they? There wasn't a scratch on Jenna, and bizarrely, even the blood that had sprayed across me during my fight on the forest path had vanished like disappearing ink. When I asked Jenna about what happened at the parking lot, she said all she remembered was a white flash on the windscreen, as if something had jumped on the car of the hood. Then nothing, but she did say she dreamed about a crying baby. Months later, when we were back in Boston, Jenna gave birth to our son. He was beautiful. We were happy for a few days. To our horror, just a short while after getting him home, his skin began to change color, like food going bad because of the air. His skin darkened as he cried for his life. I called 911, but it was too late. He stopped breathing in Jenna's arms. We were overcome with grief I cannot describe. Looking down at our beautiful boy, his skin now the color of mold, his eyes frozen, open, looking up at us. We heard the paramedics come into our home downstairs, but before they reached us, the miraculous happened. Suddenly our son began breathing again. His eyes rolled around, and his skin began to change color back to its original healthy tone. But the change did not stop. It grew paler and paler. 
until there was no doubt that we were staring at one of the children of the forest. Then before our very eyes, and I will swear this until my dying breath, our sun began to fade away, just as the blood had evaporated on my clothes. As the last outline of him vanished, he let out the laugh of a child far older than his few days. That laugh moved off into the air and out through the nearest window, fading to nothing. If it wasn't for the paramedics who saw the last moment themselves, the police would have thought we disposed of our own child. We didn't. He was never our child to begin with. He was of the forest, and I'm certain that's where he now lives, lost in a sea of green. And what of our own unborn child? Was he taken from Jenna's body in the forest? Is it possible he lives there too? That possibility haunts me, as do these memories I've finally put into words. Jenna and I remain married, though we swore after that day never to have another child. Perhaps the effects of what we encountered in that forest still linger in her body. Who knows what we would have brought into this world? Jake Sato, May 11th, 2019. I hope you enjoyed Sea of Green by author Michael Whitehouse, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed the tales you've heard tonight, I'd like to remind you one last time that tonight's featured author has more for you to sink your teeth into. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse. Once more, that's simplyscarypodcast.com slash whitehouse and check out his books, his audio projects, or just what he has on his mind. And if you decide to give any of this talented author's books a read, please consider leaving him a quality review and a kind word, and be sure to let him know you heard about him on this program and that Otis sent you. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks again for your support of this show and for tonight's featured author. Now, before we go, I'd like to... Take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark, the first installment of our eighth incredible season. Twenty-three more episodes are on the way, so be sure to check back every Sunday for more tales to terrify. If you've enjoyed what you heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season's passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive, dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, 
and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O T I S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>